Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. It's April 6, 2017, and it's Goddess Kring podcast number 25 on April 6. So I've been doing this for 25 weeks, and I also record my voice on a smartphone app called Anchor, where you do short little clips that disappear every 24 hours, and I link those to my Twitter and my Facebook almost every day. I was just telling a story, actually, about meeting Jeff Bridges, the actor, Uh, Tonight in Seattle, I'm auditioning for a play. And if I get the part, I guess I'll perform it like five or six times in a live theater production around Seattle. I don't want to say anything else about it other than if I get the part, I'll let you know and I will talk about when and where and all that jazz. But uh, I haven't done a lot of acting. I've taken a bunch of acting classes at Freehold Theater here in Seattle, did some acting in high school and have done off and on performances throughout my life. Time. I love acting and performing, though I'm a bit introverted, so I'm not a super extroverted performance actor type of a person, but I was an extra in a film directed by Martin Bell in 1991 or two in Seattle called American Heart, starring Jeff Bridges and Eddie Furlong, who was the child actor in what it was at Terminator 2 with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, So I got to meet Jeff Bridges in this film, American Heart. I tapped him on the shoulder. Actually, embarrassingly, I gave him a nude photo of myself. So uh, I wish someday if I ever meet Jeff Bridges again, which is unlikely, I would like to apologize to him for giving him a nude photo of myself because I imagine that that came across as me trying to be some kind of a groupie to him or something. I don't know, but he handled it very tactfully. Uh, I tapped Jeff Bridges on the shoulder on the set. This is how I met him. He was an executive producer on the film called American Heart, directed by Martin Bell, who also did a an amazingly good documentary about Seattle homeless kids called Streetwise, which I think was in 1984, maybe or the early 80s, and 1991 or 2 was American Heart, which is a fictitious film, but I think partly the screenplay was inspired by his documentary that he made on Seattle Street Kids. So I was dancing at the Lusty Lady in my early 20s, the nude dance place, kind of peep show place, uh, across from the Seattle Art Museum, which is now no longer in existence, the Lusty Lady, went out of business, I think, but uh, I'm not sure why, but I, (laughs) the reason why I got the part in American Heart was actually I wasn't asked to, they filmed it partly at the Lusty Lady because there was a couple characters in the film that were dancers, and so they needed an interesting set location, so they chose the Lusty Lady, and they told us to come and audition and I wasn't chosen for one of the dance scenes and I'm actually kind of glad I was chosen for a street scene where I got to stand outside on a street corner with punk rockers fully clothed and I'm glad because um, if I was in the dance scene it would just be me nude and you probably wouldn't see much of anything because you know the nudity is is done very subtly in that film because they're not allowed to really show a lot of nudity and so I'm kind of glad I'm actually known for being nude anyway so the fact that I'm in an acting scene where I'm standing on a street corner and I actually get to look at a car and 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 respond to what I see I just remember that like a little bit of acting that I actually got to do on camera on a movie set was really fun. Uh, I remember they made us do it over and over and over again, and we were just the extras, let alone the actual actors with speaking parts had to do scenes over and over and over, and I actually got to watch Jeff Bridges act, which was quite um, interesting, and he was very patient, and they kept having to give him a fresh pair of socks because his feet kept getting cold and wet because they had the streets sprayed down for the scene, and he was he was pretending like he was drunk and playing the ukulele. But basically, I tapped Jeff Bridges on the shoulder and introduced myself, and I made him a little hand-painted um, thing that said Jeff Bridges, and it had a Kring design on it, which was nice. I'm glad I did that. But then inside, I gave him nude pictures of myself. I mean, I was just standing there, nothing like, you know, weird pornographic, but I was just standing 
in my hand painted boots. <laughs> so when I gave him these pictures of myself, and I, I, I wrote on the I wrote him a card and I said, you know, I really love the movie The Fisher King with you and Robin Williams. It really inspired me. I saw it several times, you know, we're, we're such a great film. Um, thank you for being an inspiration and such a good creative person. And he's like, well, thank you. That's very sweet of you. And then he said, oh, did you paint your boots? You know, he made no reference to the fact that I was giving him nude photos, which I imagine he thought was pretty strange. Uh, but so that I'm embarrassed that I did that. But uh, I don't really know what I was trying to do. Just get his attention, I guess, and stand out. Maybe I had fantasies of being an actor. I don't know what my deal was. But in my early 20s, um, yeah. So I was dancing at the Lusty Lady and I had just gotten into modeling for artists for figure painting and drawing classes and um, just feeling like comfortable dancing nude. And so I gave Jeff Bridges nude photos of myself. Oh my gosh, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I had just given him some art. But he was a really nice person to me. And uh, he's like, oh, I paint. I'm, you know, that's neat that you paint your shoes. And I know Jeff Bridges actually does music and really cool black and white photography with a film camera that he has. So uh, I'm glad I got to meet Jeff Bridges, but I'm embarrassed about what I did, giving him nude pictures of myself. That's pretty weird, I know. Oh, well, whatever. Um, so we all do embarrassing things in our lives, don't we? Yes, we do. So yeah, that's just the tip of the iceberg, actually. But I get to audition for a play tonight, and I'm happy and excited about that, a little bit nervous, and hopefully I'll get the part or not, whatever works out, works out. Yesterday, I delivered groceries, which was kind of miserable. I didn't make very good money, and I worked for five hours, although I kind of like shopping for people. There's aspects of it that I like. I'm learning all kinds of new things about Google Maps and how to get places in strange back roads and unusual um, geography. But, okay, so I told my Jeff Bridges story. I was listening to another, oh yeah, American Heart. If you rent it, I'm in the part where there's punk rockers standing on a street corner and there's a hooker. One of the characters is, is down on her luck and so she's like hooking for extra money. This movie is a pretty intense, sad, dark movie about a Jeff Bridges gets out of prison and his son wants to come and live with him. And he may or may not want that to happen because he has kind of a troubled relationship with his son. And so this movie is about people sort of down and out on the streets of Seattle and having kind of a rough life. So there's a, a, a prostitute standing on the street corner and there's a car that pulls up and she goes, hey, baby, what's up? And right when she says that, the camera is at an angle where you see me reading a book and I kind of turn and look towards the car like, hey, what's going on with that car and that when that woman, hey, baby, what's up? So that is my acting that I got to do. I remember I was proud because the wardrobe people in American Heart were having, they had a whole trailer of a clothing, thrift store clothing, and they had this like trailer that they brought on set and to help extras change, you know, into different costumes if need be. And I remember they made a lot of people, a lot of extras in American Heart, like change their outfits and tweak their outfits. They told us to dress kind of funky and colorful and like how we would dress if we were kind of hanging out on the street a lot in the early 90s. And I remember I wore hand-painted boots, a uh, hand-painted purse that I made, and I had on, let's see leggings and a mini skirt like a pink polka dot mini skirt and a teal sweatshirt that I had added sparkles to and I remember thinking okay this is funky and colorful I'm hoping they'll like this for the movie for my costume and sure enough they looked at me and they went oh you're perfect just the way you are it's perfect and they didn't make me change my outfit at all so I'm really really happy about that and uh, proud of that. Although <laughs> they actually had me stand farther away from the camera. The camera was filming us from across the street in an alley kind of near Yesler and First Avenue in Pioneer Square. And <laughs> I was wearing pretty bright colors like teal and pink and my hair was kind of dyed a um, magenta reddish pinkish color at the time. And they're like, okay, can you have that one extra stand a little farther away? She's a little too bright in the camera lens and the camera frame. So I had to stand a little farther away from the camera. So I was a little embarrassed by that. 
Uh, but I'm just happy that they liked my outfit. And uh, I'm so I'm in the movie American Heart just for like about two seconds, maybe 1.5 seconds. I'm not sure. But I really liked acting and doing it over and over and over again. I don't know why I haven't pursued more acting. I've taken a few classes at Freehold Theater in Seattle. Uh, improv, acting step one, step two, voiceover, movement. I really love doing those classes, although I noticed I was a lot better during the live performance with the real audience than I was at rehearsing with my fellow classmates. It seems like I got really nervous around my classmates and I was actually more comfortable with the audience. So that's kind of unusual and strange and I guess that means I'm an introverted extrovert. In other words, I'm somebody who's comfortable going into my own little world and yet I want to share like right now I'm speaking into a microphone and putting this on public websites so I think if I was a total introvert would I want to be recording my voice and sharing it with you probably not so there's obviously part of me ever since I was like three years old I've always wanted to have a microphone and share with people something about my life and hope to inspire and entertain people I've always had that desire and I don't know how much of that was I was neglected as a kid and didn't get enough attention or how much of that I was just born with so I'm not sure about that but who knows but okay so I was an extra in American Heart and I don't think I've actually been an extra in any other film let's see unless I forgot something probably not I was almost an extra in a couple other films and then that fell apart long story so I'm going to audition for a play tonight. And I was thinking about um, the idea of introverted extrovert and how I'm introspective and I like being alone a lot. And yet I like to share with people and I'm comfortable being in the World Naked Bike Ride and the Body Pride Ride and the Summer Solstice Parade here in Seattle in body paint, practically nude with a little bit of body paint, G-string pasties and or fully nude when possible and I'm just very comfortable doing that and waving at the audience. But what's interesting is after the after the bike ride is over, I'm not as comfortable hanging out with the fellow bike riders. I mean, there's lots of really nice people that ride in these bike rides together. But I generally don't really feel like socializing after I'm done with a bike ride. I just kind of want to run off and take pictures of myself and of of uh, various colorful things that I see and then just go off by myself so or maybe make a video about about the experience instead of like being really social with other people so but I love waving at the audience and you know being in front of an audience with other performers and there's just something really thrilling about it having people clap and cheer for us and there's just lots of good energy going on between the audience and the performers. And I get kind of high from that, kind of a natural high. Plus there's endorphins. When you ride your bike a lot, you get the endorphin high. So that's what I was going to say about that is I like performing and then I like going off by myself. And I like writing and then recording it and reading it. So maybe that's what I'll do now is I'll read some poetry that I wrote. So you're listening to Hollow Earth Radio. This is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring on Hollow Earth Radio. Podcast number, what is it, 25 or yeah, 25 weeks I've been doing this. It's now April 6, 2017. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Shannon Kringen. I'm a multimedia artist. I also 24-7 archive this podcast on Mixcloud, Bandcamp, YouTube, and Patreon, and it's all free to listen to 24-7. I also have a, a thing that I record on called Anchor. If you like to record your voice, it's a free app you can sign up for called Anchor, and every day you can record your voice, I think up to five-minute clips, and then after 24 hours, it goes poof. You can keep it and archive it for yourself, but it goes poof. So I've been sharing musical clips that I've done of my poetry and my music and my experimental spoken word. And that's just really fun to share. So thank you for listening. Paradox through the door, a group for loners, and they all showed up. Oxymorons through the door, 
a group for loners, and they all showed up. Now, I wanted to share that um, a group for loners is a joke that I have in one of my poems because I'm kind of a loner who doesn't really like groups, and yet there's times when I feel like I want to connect with groups. Actually, I'm actually quite comfortable in groups that are like support groups and grief and loss groups and therapy groups. I've done things like that where one person talks at a time and there's no crosstalk and everybody gets to share their story and then listen and have empathy and compassion and support each other. I'm really comfortable with those kinds of groups. I guess I like it when the goal is to heal and grow and learn and share and listen and have compassion and feel safe. I'm very comfortable with that kind of a group. And I also belong to a creative writing uh, group where we free write for 20, 30, 40 minutes, and then we sit in a circle and we read out loud to each other what we wrote. And we don't really critique each other. We just listen and share and share input if we want or feedback if we want, but mostly it's just to support each other in writing and being creative. The other night I was in a focus group And I was, let's see, it was just women. I was hoping that it would be a mix of men and women, but it was just women who were there. And everyone in the group had a husband and kids and like a big family that they lived with. And the focus group was about um, uh, being low income and what are the what are the challenges that you face as a low income person with a family? What are your education and career goals and what are the pros and cons and what would you need for your community to feel more supported? And so that's what this fo- focus group was about. And I felt uh, it kind of triggered me a little bit. Like I did a fine job. I shared. I contributed. Everyone there was asked questions and we all shared our stories. And then they took notes and they're going to, you know, just keep track of the data because they're trying to learn how to run a certain organization in a better way by getting feedback from us. And the thing is, I felt... um, like a misfit like I didn't but I felt kind of like I didn't belong and you know like I was the only one there I've never been married I've never had kids I live by myself I'm an only child and I'm an artist and a full-time freelance art model so I've had kind of an unusual job for the last 25 years full-time freelance and I did my goddess cream tv show and I'm doing this radio show every week and I'm just kind of an unusual person in that way and everyone else there was married and had kids and just seemed a bit more conventional to me I mean everyone is unique everyone in the room is unique I'm sure if we really got down to the nitty-gritty and asked people really personal questions there'd probably be different kinds of responses from each person But generally, I just felt kind of like, okay, I'm 48 years old. I've never had kids. I've never been married. I've never really had the desire to have kids or get married. I have a boyfriend, but I I like that I don't live with him. And uh, he's, he's said that maybe he would like me to live with him sometimes. But now we're going back to both feeling, I think we both feel comfortable that we don't live together and that we have freedom and space to do our own thing when we're not seeing each other. So I just felt kind of like a misfit and kind of like, I don't want to judge myself, but then I'm thinking, okay, well, what I need to do is belong to a group for loners. And they all showed up. Oxymorons through the door, a group for loners, and they all showed up. So I'm thinking that that actually would be interesting to see what kind of people would show up to a group That's for people who generally are loners and don't really like to join groups because you might attract some really interesting individuals to a group such as that. Just an idea. Winds on spiral drive. drive. Winds on spiral drive. 
Bada boo, bada bing, stinging rings the crane. Catch the winds on spiral drive. Crack the code left and right, no. Solving the can of worms on my own. Smoky hands, rough and cracked. Take the sand and stand alone, all one. I present the present. Desert the desert. Exercise, bring exorcism. Cleanse, cleanse. Illusion to erosion, erosion guides fusion to explosion. Fusion drives illusion to erosion, erosion guides fusion to explosion. No thanks to the tanks of skank. I reject the neglect. Funnel cloud dancing loud. I want to be the center of attention. I want to be the center of attention. Pretension of invention. Straining to contain the demon. Straining, straining to contain the demon. Straining to contain the demon. Fusion draws illusion to Erosion guides fusion to explosion. Winds on spiral drive. Winds on spiral drive. Winds on spiral drive. Bada boo, bada boom, steam rings the crane. Volcano rash, a lantern green, enchanted fingers filter rain. Winds on spiral drive. Winds on spiral drive. Fusion drives illusion to erosion. Erosion guides fusion to explosion. That was Windsong Spiral Drive, which I recorded with Claxton Kent in Portland, Oregon a couple years back. And now listen to a dream I had about Donald Trump. I've been down a screen in Seattle. I just had the funniest dream. I was in a hotel room, well, more like a hotel suite with Donald Trump and his wife and his he had a bunch of girlfriends and mistresses and a bunch of men in business suits and i was teasing trump and he kept losing uh patches of his hair and his scalp and i was like i can sell these on ebay and he was just laughing and he's like yeah you probably could why don't you try to sell those and make some money sell patches of my scalp with dandruff and the whole deal and then I was joking with him about this country really isn't a democracy. It's just a bank, right? And you're just taking it to the next level. And that this country, USA, has been going in this direction for a long time. And Trump is just taking it to the next level of corruption and being like a casino and a bank and a corporation. 
people are hoarding and embezzling money. And Trump was laughing and saying, you're absolutely right. That's what we're doing. What's the big deal? You know, this is the money game. This is what we do here. This is what we want to do. It's all a lot of fun. We're making money. We're having fun. And he was laughing. And his advisors were laughing. We were all laughing together about how they're just playing a game with money. And that this has never really been a democracy, at least not for the last several decades. It hasn't really been a democracy. Was it ever really a democracy? Or just a fantasy of a democracy? So it was a really funny dream. And I kept saying really ballsy things. And they didn't kick me out. They kept saying, yeah, you're right. Yeah, this is what we're doing. We're playing games. We're making money. We're laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> we don't care about the average citizen. We don't really care. We're just here to make money and play games with war and Wall Street and financial corruption and environmental destruction because we just want to make money and have no regulations and have total freedom to do whatever we want. And then Trump walks off with one of his girlfriends to go out to dinner. And I said, have fun being a call girl hooker for your man. And she just laughed and went, yes, I will. I'll have lots of fun. I'll make lots of money. So that was a really funny dream. And it was the Donald Trump Incorporated USA casino dream. Hanging out in a hotel suite with a bunch of um, rich businessmen, corrupt financial mafia people, embezzlers, bunny hoarders, and hookers and call girls, and that is basically who Donald Trump is. He's a, uh, yeah, he's just a money game player, and he loves lawsuits, and he loves drama, and he loves just playing a funny game, so what a weird dream that was. I kind of feel better now. I have more of a sense of humor about how corrupt things are and how absurd things are. And how they don't really care about what the truth is about anything. There's no ethics. There's no... In fact, they'd love to just change all the laws so that they're legally allowed to do every corrupt thing that they can imagine and hoard all the money and embezzle all the money and destroy the environment because they want to make more money. I'm sure he loves Monsanto, too, which is destroying the environment and lying about it. And now Monsanto is pretending that it want to help, wants to help the bees. The bees are probably dying because of the chemicals that Monsanto uses. So what a dream. Oh, my God. Have a sense of humor about the corruption. We should still try to make the world a better place, though, and push for democracy and push for ethics and democratic socialism to help make capitalism less toxic. Um, but I think it is good to have a sense of humor about the absurdity. I know if George Carlin was still alive, he'd be having a field day. There'd be so much new comedy coming out of George Carlin's mouth. We would just be laughing our heads off. Thanks for listening. Have a good day. Good morning. This is Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring in Seattle. And last night... Or this morning, I had a dream about Amanda Palmer, the musician and the lady who wrote the book, The Art of Asking. Very good book. Um, I don't love her music, but I love her attitude and I love her passion and her dedication. I always want to like her music. I've, I've tried to listen to many different songs of hers and I just can't really get into loving it. But I really admire her on so many levels. So this dream had a, and I love her TED Talk, this dream was about her doing some kind of public installation in the public library that's in my small hometown on Whidbey Island in Langley. And she was there, and I was walking her around Langley uh, trying to help her figure out where the free parking spots were. And there was some kind of strange, like, she was, like, acting out a role of being a punk rocker in the library. And it was to inspire and entice more people to read and more people to get into their inner punk rock artist. And I don't really know what the dream was about, really, but that, that was one of my dreams last night or this morning or something like that. I actually have a page on my website where I think I wrote my dreams down. Maybe I'll link that. Um, I'm hoping that the sound clip thing works. Is anyone else having trouble with those? I'm having a hard time adding clips. 
because I have a lot of mp3s that I would like to share of music and poetry that I've created. Today I'm going to go to my creative writing group and then deliver groceries and then tomorrow I'm going to model for an art class in a costume. Usually I'm nude and I'm going to then get a massage. So enjoy your day everyone. Be yourself no matter what they say. So now that we're on the theme of dreams, I figure instead of just talking about politics the whole time this this episode of my podcast, I think I will talk about dreams and the importance of imagination and the subconscious and the psyche. I'm going to read for you now part of a dream I had with Bob Dylan and I call it Inner Architecture Golden Ticket. I had this dream actually April 1st, 2013, so almost exactly four years ago. Um, and there's a lady named Marion Woodman who is a, um, a psychologist, a, kind of a Jungian psychologist. So here it is. I had this comforting and reassuring dream days ago, and it's still with me. I was in a daze the whole day after waking from this one. The atmosphere in this dream was very, very strong, felt solid and real. Musician Bob Dylan was sitting next to me on brown velvet seats in an old bus. The seats squeaked when we shifted our weight while sitting. In his beautiful Dylan voice, he told me, Shannon, I'm fascinated by your inner architecture. How do, how do you know this? I asked him. I saw your video, Amplified Chameleon. That's my Bob Dylan impersonation, if you hadn't have already guessed. I saw your video, a- Amplified Chameleon. I looked at him puzzled. You, you gave it to me, remember? Oh, you gave it to me, remember? Said Bob Dylan. I want to see your book, Shannon. Please show me Art, Identity, and the Sacred. You told me about it, he continued. Should I do it in the Bob Dylan voice? Okay, let's start again. In his beautiful Dylan voice, he told me, Shannon, I'm fascinated by your inner architecture. How do you know this? I asked him. I saw your video, Amplified Chameleon. I looked at him puzzled. You gave it to me, remember? I want to see your book, Shannon. Please show me your art identity in the sacred book. They told me about it. He continued, I am moved by your depth and poetic nature. You are authentic like me. Your true nature is alive and awake. Don't let them stamp it out of you. I told him, my dad raised me on your music, Bob. I love the way you change decade to decade. Oh, good, you're one of those, he said and smiled at me, touching my arm in a loving way. I could smell his breath when he spoke to me, and it was a sexy smell. His blue eyes were alert, sensitive, intelligent. Come fly with me and my crew. We go to Oslo next. You're welcome to join us. (laughs) I felt another presence. I looked at my side and saw Jungian analyst Marion Woodman sitting next to me and Dylan. She smiled at me as if to say, trust yourself. Bob Dylan leaned over and kissed me on the lips passionately. My brain, heart, and vagina were all affected in an energizing way by his kiss. The energy was powerful. You are a rare gem, just as Dylan is, Shannon. Marion Woodman, okay, I don't know how to imitate (laughs) Marion Woodman's voice, but she's like, you are a rare gem, just as Dylan. Dylan, a rare gem, just as Dylan is, Shannon, Marion Woodman told me. I looked back towards Dylan, and he was suddenly in another vehicle looking at me through the back window of an old silver car. He put his hand on the window towards me. He was saying goodbye to me or gesturing for me to come with him. I looked back at Marion Woodman and asked her how I could get Dylan's crew to let me join them with no papers. She handed me a golden ticket and told me, this will do the trick. The gates will be open to you. I looked again at Dylan in the car driving away. It was in slow motion. Dylan blew a kiss to me and looked sad. I started crying and the dream faded out. So even though this dream ended with sadness, 
and a very unresolved sudden ending, the interactions with Bob Dylan and me and Marion Woodman archetypes affirmed to me to trust myself and I found this to be a very, very healing dream. So that was really interesting. I have a tendency to have dreams that are like quick vignettes and one thing fades to another very, very quickly and, and things don't get resolved. And I sometimes used to have a lot of dreams that involved spiral staircases. I have a poem I wrote called A Suicide Spiral Staircase, Moonstone Sand Dune, Sandstone Moon Dune. High bloom through the roots in cahoots, sliding doors, eyes adore, ocean beam come clean, come clean, manifesting dreams. So um, that's part of one of my poems, but I have these dreams also that involve lots of wires and like mops and toilets and like obstacles basically of being in a big room full of obstacles and like tripping over wet mops and hoses and strange staircases that lead nowhere and elevators that go sideways like escalators and yet they're elevators like you go inside them and the door shuts like it's an elevator but you go sideways it's very different very strange so those are some of the patterns in some of my dreams with that Bob Dylan dream the memory of it has faded but when I'm listening to myself recite it I can sort of remember that mood so here's another dream I had December 15th 2011 dream involving Tom Petty Tori Amos Eddie Vedder following my heart keeping faith I was sitting in a magic seat in front of the van next to the windshield of the Tom Petty tour van facing him with ex-boyfriend who is now my good friend. Tom Petty was in the driver's seat, but the van was magically driving itself. No one was driving in a normal way, but we all felt safe. Girls kept coming up to Tom Petty all flirty-eyed, winking and smiling and asking him to come sit with them, and I knew it meant make out with them, and that he had done that with them already, even though he partly didn't want to because they were so young and he is happily married. Tom Petty was counting money from t-shirt and poster sales and writing it all down with a green pen in a purple notebook. He looked concerned. In walks a lady in, white la in a white lacy shirt with a very distinct see-through pattern at the bottom front of the shirt. Straight brown hair, brown eyes. Very young was pregnant slightly and telling us how to do leg stretches. I noticed she had a little black, she had, oh wait, sorry, I lost my place. She had on little black ankle boots and black leggings. Heels and ankles could, her, her heels and ankles could bend more than 180 degrees around in circles, but less than 360. I guess my ex and I were sitting facing everyone on the bus like, like we were their audience. Our seat was floating and not attached to the floor or the vehicle. I also wanted to make out with Tom Petty, but not as a groupie. I wanted to be his wife or at least real girlfriend that he truly loved. I hesitated to tell him this and sat there shyly watching Tom Petty count money and interact with girl after girl sitting next to him. What I really wanted to tell him was how I heard his song Refugee on a jukebox when I was 11, and it changed my life. That song helped me deal with feeling like a refugee from San Diego when we moved to Woodby Island. My mom took me away from California and sunny San Diego against my wishes and the rest of our family. Suddenly the dream cut to me walking home alone on a rainy street. Oh, let me make sure this is still working. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Suddenly the dream cut to me walking home alone on a rainy street and seeing a rusty old metal sign that said, Even No Flow. And I knew Eddie Vedder, lead singer of Pearl Jam, who is friends 
and has performed with Tom Petty. I knew Eddie Vedder's soul was watching me from the clouds above, and he cared about me and wanted me to love myself and find authentic, loving, romantic relationships. He knew I could heal enough to find a loving and sexually connected partnership with a man. I was crying my eyes out in my head, but not literally while walking. Another, deep of part of, another deeper part of me was crying while the surface me was just walking quietly and looking at the shiny, rain-soaked streets and amber streetlights in the fog, making interesting patterns. I had intense empathy for Tom Petty about having a nice mom who told him he could do anything he dreamed of, and his dad who beat him and wanted him to go hunt and fish when all Tom Petty wanted to do was stay in his room and listen to music while other kids played outside. I wanted to thank Tom Petty for following his dream, so glad the contrast of his parents seemed to propel him to follow his passion for music and be an artist full-time and not let anyone distract him from his dream. His songwriting and his amazing chemistry and relationship with the musicians and his band, The Heartbreakers, who have known each other ever since their teen years. They are now like 60-something years old. Great dream. I feel a little frustrated. A recurring pattern in my dreams is me wanting to speak up about something and then being afraid of being judged by other people in the dream, so I keep quiet. My dreams usually involve famous people, I think, because I want to be famous myself and because I am so deeply affected by music, art, theater, movies, and I pay more attention to performing artists than I do to people who are personal friends and family. I love performing in visual arts and like to have as much of my life focused on watching and creating visual performance art as possible. Last night I saw Tori Amoson live in Seattle for her Night of Hunters tour and Tom Petty music played before and after the show. I think this triggered the dream. Plus, Tori Amos is very shamanistic with her music. Intense stuff shining light on dark things many don't want to look at. She's all about diving deep into the psyche and not denying anything at all. Also, her lyrics are sometimes in code and very abstract and pretty much metaphorical. Tom Petty and Tori Amos are my two favorite songwriters and performers currently. Something about them both connects in my head. I sort of see them as mythic figures who comfort me with their music and tell me, follow your heart, listen to it, Shannon. You'll be okay if you do this. You will find your way. Let go of your worry and keep your authentic path. Funny, I also had my dream tending book in my paper, oh, in my backpack while at the Tori Amos show. I wonder if that, book's, that book gives off energy of pay attention and have vivid dreams and tend them. I slept with a book next to me also. Basically, I use the artists I enjoy to work, enjoy the work of as shamanic guides reflecting wisdom back to me. Almost like reading tarot cards, the wisdom is in what I see in them, not in the cards themselves. The magic is within me and all of us. So that was interesting. So that was a dream involving Tori Amos and Tom Petty, or that was mostly the Tom Petty dream. Interesting to note that a few years after that, my uh, currently in 2017, my boyfriend plays in a rock cover band, and his bass player is actually the driver of Eddie Vedder. Uh, I've never actually met Eddie Vedder personally, but it's just interesting that I'm dating a guy who actually is semi-friendly with Eddie Vedder. Apparently, Eddie Vedder is a, is a nice person and kind, a kind soul, and has a bit of a friendship with the limo driver that drives him around sometimes. So I imagine he has more than one driver, but um, it's just funny that I know somebody who drives Eddie Vedder in a limo from time to time. It's just interesting. So um, those are some of my dreams. I told you about the Donald Trump dream, which was 2017. The Bob Dylan inner architecture golden ticket dream was from with Marion Woodman, Jungian analyst. 2013. The dream with Tom Petty, Tori Amos, and Eddie Vedder following my heart keeping faith was from 2011. I also have this dream from 2009 that I might tell you about. Let me just check out 
this audio thingy Mick Jagger. Ooh, I think it's time to get a massage soon as well. I want to be on the wild side of the fence. Had a dream about moving out in this strange house in the country, way, way, way far from the city. The narrow paths hard to walk through, and some macho sheriff person telling me, No bicycles on the sidewalk here, ma'am. Creepy, especially since I saw no sidewalks anywhere. There was a huge fence near our house that kept the bears and any animal over 50 pounds on the other side, away from the humans, with weird threatening signs explaining this. There was a giant rock wall under the electric metal fence and a steep grade hill leading up to it. The tiny house we moved into was made of wood and plastic yogurt, yogurt containers and it smelled like sour yogurt. Our cats didn't like it there and told us with their eyes. We had a black dog suddenly that was a mandatory guard dog for living in the community, they told us. It seemed like a sweet dog at first, but then it changed from long black hair to light gray. Whenever it spoke, the dog would start talking, and then I realized it was a person in a fur dog suit with, a gray, f with gray face paint on and really bad acne that looked painful. This person said they hated dressing up like a dog and wanted to be their real self again and get out of this dog costume. As soon as the fake dog stopped talking... They would turn back into a real dog, and then the fur would go away, and the light gray back to black. There was some strange triple-decker elevator car ramp freeway, very hard to explain, with spiral staircase cement ramps all over, and I kept getting lost on my bicycle trying to find my friend with his car to put my bike on the rack. Our two cats and our new dog were following me, and I was worried about all the cars driving near us. Whenever I would go to the house we lived, my legs would scrape on the branches of shrubs on the extremely narrow trail along a steep hill by our home. I kept almost tripping over the very worn and rough patch of dirt with grass and plants surrounding it. I would guess this trail path was only two inches wide, very hard to walk on and keep your balance. We had to park a mile away and walk the trail to the house. My bicycle wouldn't even work on this trail. It was so narrow. There were all these little white plastic containers hanging from our porch of petunia flowers. They were not in dirt. They were growing in white plastic bags and white rocks. No dirt anywhere to be seen. These plants told me in their telepathic way they were not happy and wanted real soil, not stupid white rocks and white plastic bags trapping them. They were alive but wilting. I was totally confused about why they were planted this way. I got the feeling it was not up to me to change it, and I would be in trouble if I tried to plant them in the normal way in some nice fresh soil. Then suddenly I felt a rabbit run past my feet as I was gazing at the big fence, keeping the wild animals separate from the humans. The rabbit was running away from the bad people who were cruel to animals. The rabbit looked at me, and I told it with my eyes telepathically that I would not harm it or interfere with its running, and that I would let it go wherever it wanted. I felt sad and like I wanted to be on the wild side of the fence. Very creepy but fascinating dream. Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, on Hollow Earth Radio. Thanks for joining me. I'm a multimedia artist and figure model and experimental human being. I have a website, shannonkringen.com. This podcast plays every week on Hollow Earth Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Every week for an hour on Thursdays right now, 3 to 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And it also gets archived after it airs fresh, new, and clean on Hollow Earth Radio in Seattle, I archive it on my Bandcamp YouTube. And when actually, when I put it on my YouTube, it turns into a video and I visually entertain you with a slideshow of my visual art and photos of me that I've taken, photos sometimes that other people have taken of me as a model, but mostly it's photos I've taken of animals, plants, 
uh, various abstract textures, urban decay. If you go to my website, shiningkringa.com, and you click on my Flickr link, you can see I have thousands of photos on my Flickr. Or just Google Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring f and just click on photos and you'll see, actually you'll see a lot of photos of me. I'm kind of sad that when you Google my name, it's mostly photos of me that show up uh, because I would like people to know that I take photos of other things besides just myself. Selfies are really cool and I've done some great ones and I'm a model, so I think of myself as a model and a photographer. But I also just want people to, to know that I take photos of lots of other things besides myself, like animals and plants. And I have a real fondness for water reflections and neon lights at night and sort of like rain painting. So my photos are Creative Commons. So just go to shannonkringa.com and you'll see. But I was going to say I archive this Kring, Goddess Kring podcast on my Bandcamp, YouTube, Patreon, and Mixcloud, and it's all free. And if you want to do a podcast, I think it's really cool in this day and age when we have so much mainstream media that's kind of shallow and propaganda and, you know, fake, and like the Jerry Springer show kind of on steroids with lots of drama and people fighting and, and yelling at each other. It's really nice that we create our own media. Was it Amanda Palmer who said, we are the media? So the media is whatever gets created, whether it's mainstream multi-billion dollar corporations or people like me who are low income sitting in my apartment with my free software called Audacity and a microphone I'm just sitting here in my apartment with a microphone, sitting by my space heater and recording myself and just making this up as I go. So if you have a desire to record your voice and share your dreams or your stories or your comedy or your poetry or interview family and friends, that would be cool. So do a podcast and record it and release it. You can upload it for free on Mixcloud and Bandcamp and YouTube. And I also have a Patreon where I upload it. So, you know, I'm surprised more people don't do podcasts. I guess not everybody wants to record their voice and maybe not everybody wants to listen. I actually have family and friends who have not heard my podcast because they're just not really into podcasts. They think it's they've told me they think it's cool that I do a podcast, but they're not particularly wanting to listen. Kind of hurts my feelings a little bit, but then again, <laughs> do I really expect everyone to want to listen to me rambling on, Shannon Kringen rambling on about whatever she feels like in her apartment? Okay, so here's another dream for you, the dream of Kring. Bada boo, bada bing, stinging rings the Kring. Here's a dream I had, May 30th, 2009, hanging out with Tom Petty's wife dream, what a trip. I met Tom Petty's wife. At first I was sad and jealous of her and thought she would be mean to me. But in this dream she hugged me and told me she understood. Many women want to spend time alone with Tom making love and want Tom to serenade them around a beach fire, etc. He's a wonderful, handsome, talented man that I married. I totally get it and have empathy for you and the others who feel this way. Isn't that cool that she said that actually in the dream? Okay, this is funny. And then what? Let's see what happens next. In this dream, I found this comforting and not embarrassing to be told this. Her and I walked all over this huge outdoor park that looked very Disneylandish. We told each other about our entire life story thus far from childhood to t until now. Then she invited me to the set of Tom's newest video. We traded business cards and planned to trade some creative ideas and things in the near future. I reminded her that I paint shoes and hats and guitar straps. Whatever you and Tom want, I said, an abstract canvas too. I am also a good photographer. <laughs> I showed her my sample photos of some magical miniature laptop I had in my pocket and she told me, dazzling Shannon, just dazzling unique work. I remember feeling proud of myself for being so open with her and having the audacity to boldly state my desires and ambitions with her and not worry if she liked me or not. I just had to speak my truth and let her have whatever opinion about me she wanted. This felt good and freeing. We both watched Tom Petty and his band on huge 
on a huge soundstage set, even got to hear Tom argue with the director of the video about a scene he wanted to do his way, and the director had different ideas. Tom wouldn't back down, and the director eventually let Tom do the scene his way. Tom's wife introduced me to Tom, and they both told me, yes, Shannon, you can make out with Tom. It's okay. We don't mind. And then suddenly I was sitting alone on a soft, bright green velvet couch with Tom Petty making out with him kissing. It was beautiful, and he kept telling me, don't worry, this is natural and from the heart. Then suddenly I was back alone with Tom's wife walking into a huge warehouse art studio that had very shiny, freshly painted gray floors and big metal black shelves. I noticed two relatives of mine who are both artists in the room standing on pedestals smiling from ear to ear. We sold our inventory, Shannon. It's great. We can now move to Ireland for good and let life go on. <laughs> Tom Petty's wife wanted then, wanted, wanted, oh, wanted to buy the rest of the inventory of their artwork, some oil paintings and huge clay vessels. I'll buy them all, she said. Just ship them to our house in Encino. Actually, they live in Malibu. And you guys go to Ireland. Tom and I will visit you there and have a concert in your living room. <laughs> Just cook us a good dinner, okay? I will show Tom your photos, Shannon. You must come to at least 35% of the shows and take photos up close of the band live on stage, okay? And publish a book, okay? What a dream. See, usually my dreams are very stressful and full of loose ends and anxiety and things not going well and me feeling afraid to speak up and say what I really want. And this dream was just like refreshing and like all these wonderful things were happening. Um, actually, sometimes I have a Tom Petty dream where his wife says, oh, go ahead. You can make out with him. I'm not jealous. And then Tom says, no, nah, I don't want to cheat on my wife. <laughs> I'm monogamous with my wife. It's funny. It's like, it's just funny. And now there's another dream called Giant Tiger Falling from the Sky and Crushing a Condo. I think I might have to save that for next week. Yep, it's getting, it's getting towards the end of this show. You've been listening to Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen Podcast. I think it's number 25, April 6, 2017. So I have another dream, Giant Tiger Falling from the Sky, Crushing a Condo. And then I have Vignettes. Greener Me, Be Me Up Scotty. So those are some of my interesting dreams. Do you write your dreams down? I took a class on dream tending and we um, wrote down as many of our dreams as we can remember. We kept dream journals and then we wrote stories based on those and tried to figure out what the metaphors meant and what our subconscious was trying to tell us. On Hollow Earth Radio, Seattle. Hey, I'm feeling scared. scared. I am feeling I'm under, feeling scrutiny. under scrutiny from some people, from some people that, are that are putting me under, putting me under, under my microscope. microscope. But mostly, but mostly the, enemy the enemy is within. Is within. Although some people have some been.
Pipe and I'm tangled up in green. Tangled up in tangled green. Up in green. Tangled up in and green. I was so much older then. And I was so much older now. I'm younger than, older that, now. Than, I'm younger younger than that now. I love you. I love you. Wanna tattoo you with my love. Goddess Kring Radio. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring Radio, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring.